Amen. You guys ready to get into the word this morning? Yes. Beautiful. Um, I know it's the 909. I know that uh, maybe we, we need an extra cup of coffee to get us woken up this morning, but I want to I wanna encourage you. Um, we're a church that's radical about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're in this sermon series called Radical, and uh, when, I, when I got asked to preach on the gospel... I got so excited. I love preaching on the gospel. This is, if somebody asked me to preach on the gospel every week, I could, I could do it. It's, it's just, it's my jam. This, this news has changed my life forever. And this is what's so beautiful is that this news is changing my life. This news is continuing to change my life. Is there anybody else in this place this morning that's saying, you know what, the gospel's not done with me yet. It's continuing to change me. This good news is continuing to be good. I'm, I haven't even scratched the surface of what it means for me. And I believe that God is still desiring, no matter where you are, no matter if you've been in church for 20 minutes or 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, that... Uh, he desires that the gospel change you this morning. We're called to continue not only in receiving the gospel, but giving the gospel. It's a big part of what we're going to be talking about this morning. It doesn't come down to who's preaching. It doesn't come down to what songs are being played. Truly this morning, in order to change, it comes down to a desperation for the presence of God. It comes down to our hearts longing and yearning for him. Think about that scripture in Psalms that says, even as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. And I want to encourage you that no matter who you are, no matter how far you've gone in the opposite direction of God, you're not too far away this morning. It's part of the good news. And uh, is that it can reach anybody. It can change anyone. And... Uh, I just want to encourage you, you can make up your mind this morning, no matter who you are, no matter what you're made of, to allow the word of God to change you. You can even turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to change this morning. If you want to change, turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm going to change this morning. (laughs) Come on. How many of you want to change the world? I feel like a lot more hands would go up if we were younger. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. Let me explain what I mean by that. No, believe me. I, I, I want to explain what I mean. I think that life teaches us the wrong things sometimes. That because we've been defeated so many times, because we got that experience now, it's like, yeah, I mean, uh, sure. Yeah, I want to change the, the world. And I remember, right, I remember back when I thought that that was really a possibility. But I want to encourage you, you're a world changer. But in order for you to change the world, you need to allow the, the word to change you. Because without the word changing you, you won't have anything to change the world with. You won't, because you'll be part of the world. This right here, this word that's active and alive and and breathing, coming off the pages, reaching into our hearts and changing stuff and shifting things and convicting things and shedding light on things and breaking down barriers and breaking down walls and breaking down strongholds and setting people free. That's the hope that we have. So as we get into the word this morning, don't, don't just allow this thing to just slip on past you like it's another book. This thing has supernatural changing capabilities. Maybe when you turn to your neighbor and you said, I want to change today, you're talking about a natural change. I I got news for you. The Holy Spirit is interested in supernatural change. The kind of change where you walked in with an addiction and you walked out free. 
Yeah. That's the hope that we have. This message is, is probably going to be directed more towards the people that have been in church for a long time than to maybe the newcomer or the person that does not yet know Jesus. But my hope is this, is that as the word is brought forth, that the person that does not believe in Jesus and the newcomer would be challenged right along with everybody else. It's the same gospel and it works for everyone. But I, I didn't want to disclude the people that have maybe been walking with God for a long time. And so I felt like the Lord was, was leading me towards this. I, I want to encourage you with this. My prayer is that if you've placed yourself on the outskirts of the action, if you've positioned yourself to be safe from the mess, if you're out of earshot to the call to sacrifice, if inconvenience is among the blocked numbers on your cell phone, my prayer is that Almighty God would begin to shake you this morning and wake you up to the reality of the fact that he's called you and we need you in this fight. We need you in this fight. And if you don't realize that this is a fight, if you don't realize that this is a spiritual battle, you're going to get caught so blindsided. And it's probably already happened. It's probably already happened. When you're in a boxing ring, I know this from firsthand experience, when you're in a boxing ring and you don't have your guard up, you get a rude awakening. When you're not moving before the, the punch is thrown, I used to think that it was dodging, like that people were quick enough to just dodge the punch. No, they were moving before the punch started. That's why the punch couldn't keep up. And I think that there are a lot of Christians that are sitting ducks right now, motionless and settled. You ever heard, you ever heard the, the term, or maybe you've said it, uh, maybe you move somewhere, you switch churches, whatever it is, and you, somebody asks you how you're doing, and you say, oh, I'm, getting, I'm getting settled in. Getting settled in. I believe this is that the church should have something unsettling about it. The church should have, listen, if God wanted you to settle, he would have left you in the form of dust. Dust settles. But he wanted something more than just settling out of you. And so he breathed life into you. And he called you to himself. And he, want, and he wants to pour his love into you. And he wants relationship with you. And he wants to use you for the furthering of his kingdom and for the furthering of the gospel. Amen. He stood at the door of your heart's tomb and called you by name. And maybe you think that you're just a normal person and that it's the, it's the remarkable people that get called to changing the world. No, check out the history and, and, and the track record of, of the gospel, <laughs> the track record of the Bible. Jesus used murderers. Jesus used tax collectors. Jesus used thieves. Jesus used adulterers and prostitutes. Jesus used the worst of the worst. And even as Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. If you're a bad person, if you have a bad past, you're in good company. It's not even in my notes. Man, I love this gospel. It's changed my life. And I, uh, I want to encourage you that uh, this morning, if you have heard the gospel a hundred thousand times, that even as you would sit down with your spouse, across the table 
for the thousandth time on a date or maybe at the, the dinner table and you think to yourself, you know what? I'm gonna treat this like the very first date. I'm gonna, I'm gonna engage with this person across the table with me like I've never even met them before. And I'm gonna be re-interested. I'm gonna be re-engaged. I wanna encourage you, re-interest yourself in the gospel. Get re-engaged with the good news of Jesus this morning, amen? Would you turn in your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter two? Come on now. Thanks, Bo. At Youth Church, we, we freak out about the Bible. And uh, he just shouted me down. Mark chapter 2. We're going to start in, in verse 14. Here we go. It says this, you guys there? Mark chapter 2, verse 14. If your neighbor's not there yet, help him along a little bit. I still hear pages rustling, so I can wait. It says this. We also got it up on the Sky Bible. So Mark chapter 2, verse 14 it says, As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. That's remarkable in and of itself. You guys notice this? This is not a normal day for Levi. <laughs> and you got to kind of hand it to him. And that's, there, there had to have been something compelling for him to get up out of his, like, he just left his job while he was working. <laughs> gets up and just leaves. You know, I'm, I'm wondering if there are other people at the booth. <laughs> you know, where's Levi going, you know? Gets up and follows him. Later, later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. I love how it says this. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of the religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. I got news for you. If you think you are righteous, this gospel is not for you. If you think you're good, you probably won't catch on to the goodness of this news. But if you are convinced, like me this morning, that you are in desperate need of salvation, if you've screwed this thing up so badly that you can't dig yourself out of the hole that you dug yourself in, the good news is for you this morning. Come on, is there anyone else that is saying, yeah, I need it, I need it. I need it. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need it. Turn to the other neighbor with some conviction and say, I need it. <laughs> Title of the talk this morning, if you're taking notes, no takers go to heaven. Um, <laughs> Title of the talk is dirt don't hurt. Dirt don't hurt. My, my prayer this morning is to get you, is to get your hands dirty with the gospel once again. Maybe if you've never participated in the furtherance of the gospel, that, that this would be your time that you step in and you decide that you want to get your hands dirty with this thing. You know, I grew up, 
I grew up kind of on a farm. I didn't live on the farm, but I spent a lot of time on my grandparents' farm. We were homeschooled, so we had a lot of time. And um, it's a funny thing. Grew up in central Washington, Moses Lake. There's a lot of dirt in Moses Lake. And um, grew up with this phrase. You've probably heard it before. God made dirt and dirt don't hurt. And uh, my, my great grandpa would say this to me on a pretty regular basis. Uh, you know, my mom, if I got a scrape uh, on my knee and it was bleeding, my mom would be like, come on, I'm gonna take you into the house. I'm gonna bandage you up. We're gonna disinfect this thing. My great grandpa, throw some dirt on it. <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. Throw some dirt on it. You know, you drop some food, you're outside. Grandpa picks it up, barely brushes it off, hands it back and say, dirt don't hurt. I moved to the big city of Los Angeles when I was about 19 years old. And uh, I quickly discovered <laughs> that there are large amounts of people that are kind of scared of dirt. They got their Versace and their Gucci and their Prada and they've got their all white shoes and they've got their really nice cars. And, and listen, there are entire cultures that try to get about as far away from the dirt as you can get. You know, you, you talk to somebody about dirt that uh, is maybe in one of those larger cities and, and it's a very different conversation than a cowboy with an old broken down pickup truck that lives out in the country. You know what I'm saying? I'm convinced of this. I want to read it the way that I wrote it. The purpose of the gathering of the church was never for it to be a sterile, dirt-free zone where the self-righteous could revel in their comfort and cleanliness. The purpose was for it to be a refuge for the dying, dirty, and broken. Sometimes I think that our churches can, can get together and click together like a holy club. Like, let's see how sterile we can get. Let's see how, how clean we can get. And we start judging other people's dirt. People walk in that are dirty and we're like, what are they doing here? Just walk past the, the third aisle and I just got this whiff of so, somebody didn't shower this morning. I've done it. You look at people's cleanliness or lack thereof around you and it becomes this competition of sterilization. And it's empty. This is the very spirit that the Pharisees carried. You're either an extension of the gospel or an opposition to it. I want you to catch this. I'm going to read it twice. Inactivity in the furtherance of the gospel is activity in the hindrance to it. Inactivity in the furtherance of the gospel, being inactive in seeing the gospel move forward, is activity in the hindrance or the opposition to it. There's no middle ground here. That's why Jesus says, listen, I'd rather spit you out my mouth if you're lukewarm. Either you're for it or against it, but don't, don't play like there's an option of the middle ground. If you call yourself a Christian this morning, it's not just the way that the gospel affects you. It's the way that you get to affect others with the gospel. God wants to use you. God wants to get your hands dirty. You see, Jesus lived a holy, righteous, blameless life. But he got down in the trenches with people. He got down in the dirt with the, with the most notorious of sinners. Broke bread with them. In that culture, it means we're good. I forgive you. 
So what does that look like for us? You see, the devil, the Bible says, is seeking whom he can devour. He's in forward motion. He is in hot pursuit of whoever that he can devour. The Bible says that the father is searching to and fro, looking for those who are all in. I wonder if the church is seeking whom she can hint Jesus to without being inconvenienced, uncomfortable, or embarrassed. It's kind of a lesser kind of seeking. God, I pray that you would just make everything line up. As long as they ask me about my Jesus t-shirt and say that they're looking for a church that's non-denominational, Holy Spirit-filled, Bible-believing, God, I just bring people to me like that, Lord. How about your three best friends that gossip all the time? How about, how about the, the difficult, dirty situations that you're already called to that God has been setting up for you for the past 20 years? I hope you know that you know that you know that I'm preaching this just as much to myself as to anybody else this morning. In fact, prepping for this message was probably one of the hardest things that I've ever done. Because there are broken people out there that I don't care about yet. That I don't have a heart capacity for yet. That I'm too good for still. That's what I want God to change this morning in me. I can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. We need you. We need you. We need you in this fight. So um, I want to give you three dirty prayers that will change your life forever. Three dirty prayers. If you're taking notes, these prayers will make your life messy. You won't be able to keep your hands clean. If you start praying these prayers, the first one is this. You guys ready? Dear Jesus, give me the messiest desires of your heart that no one else wants to carry out. And then help me accomplish them like you would today. I want to read it one more time. Dear Jesus, oh, there we go. Give me the messiest desires of your heart that no one else wants to carry out and then help me accomplish them like you would today. When I wrote this prayer down, after I felt like the Holy Spirit was leading me to, I didn't even pray it right away. I didn't want to. Why? Because there are other things that I would much rather do. Anyone else? Like you watch those uh, dirty jobs, you know, on TV, and it's so entertaining because it's so nasty and gross. And, and you want God to send you to the spiritual version of that? <laughs> spiritual dirty jobs. Like, that's what we're called to, people. The gospel wants to get into the messiest places of your city. The messiest relationships the dirtiest places. And we can't get there if we're not dressed for service. You see, we, we, we do this thing in our culture where we get dressed for service, but it's more like we get dressed for people to serve us. Do you notice? Like it's so admirable when maybe a guy in a movie 
uh, when he's dressed up really nice, you know what I mean, three-piece suit and everything, he, he sees somebody that needs help and maybe they need their, their, their tire changed or whatever it is and he throws off his jacket and rolls up his sleeves and even with grease on him and grime, grime on him, he's helping this lady out, whatever it is. You know what I'm talking about? Why is that so cool is because no matter what he's dressed like like this, there's something that he's dressed like in here. And we're called to dress for service. No matter what we look like, no matter what we're wearing, no matter what our social sphere is like, what are you, too, what are you called to that you're too good for? I have to ask myself that. What are we called to that we're too good for? Second one. I uh, know I'm going to keep going on the first one. You ready? Great sacrifice. This is what it requires. Maybe it means... One less vacation this, this year or a different destination of your vacation. Maybe God wants you to go to Honduras instead of the Bahamas. I wouldn't be suggesting it if God hadn't messed up my plans already. But he does that. He does that. And it's so much better than what you had in mind. Maybe it means that you become a little bit less of a workaholic. Maybe you no longer get your identity from how hard you work and how amazing people tell you that you are at your job and everything like that. And maybe you spend more time with your family and maybe you spend more time with the people that, that, that need Jesus in your social sphere. Listen, maybe, maybe you're called to have a better work ethic. That's me. Maybe the way that you preach the gospel by how you actually operate in your workplace. <laughs> Maybe that's where it needs to improve. Maybe those three friends that you've been with for the past 20 years. Maybe you need to expand your relationship horizon. There's nothing wrong with close friends. There's something wrong with the gospel being limited by your clique. Maybe you invite your clique to invite some people into your clique. And to invite some more people in. And maybe you start, instead of it being a, a self-help club, where you get together and listen, there's nothing wrong with this. But once again, if the gospel is limited by it, then there's something wrong. But if you meet at Starbucks every week for 10 years, but nobody at Starbucks ever hears about the gospel, there's nothing additional that takes place. There's something wrong. You see, we're called to the Great Commission. It's a crazy staggering statistic of how many Christians don't even know what the Great Commission is. And even a fewer percentage actually can like quote it or, or say it or know what it means. To go into all the world. Some, some of you are like, oh yeah, that one. <laughs> to, go, to, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Do you know that you're a preacher? You are. You affect people. Your life preaches. Did you know that on average, you're probably going to leave about four to six hairs on your chair before you get up, except for Bobby. <laughs> Beard hair. Um, I'm serious. I was, I was here the other week Eli walked in with a bunch of lint rollers. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, look at the chairs, bro. And I looked closely. <laughs> no, y'all are doing it. I, <laughs> you make a bigger impact than you realize. You leave stuff places. You affect other people. All right, number two, dear Jesus. Somebody say, dear Jesus. 
Thank you for giving me everything. What should I give away today? You see, when you, when you start living a life of generosity and you have a generous mentality, you start having a generous gospel mentality. You see, this gospel was meant to be given. It was meant to be extended. And when you are focused on what can I give rather than what can I get, the gospel, sharing the gospel becomes a whole lot easier. What can I offer? It's one of the strongest transitions from the world to a, a, a Christ-following life is you go from what can I get to what can I give. It's one of the most beautiful markings of someone that knows the Holy Spirit. And I've watched it in, in, in countless people's lives. They walk in to church going, this is what I need and this is what I want and this is what, how everything affects me. And then I slowly start to see this transition and this, this shift that takes place. And all of a sudden they're asking me how I'm doing. And all of a sudden they're asking how they can serve me. And all of a sudden, you, you guys hear what I'm saying? Generosity. shouldn't be confined to tithes and offerings. Should be our lifestyle. It's the gospel mindset. What can I give? This is what's so beautiful is that because it's one of the biggest transitions, it's one of the biggest things that the world notices about a believer as well. So this is what, this is what ends up happening um, people start realizing that you don't need your possessions to make you happy anymore. Or that you don't need, you know, like all of a sudden your lifestyle starts saying, yeah, I don't, I don't need that fancy car to make me, to fulfill me anymore. The gospel does that for me now. I don't, I don't need those compliments. I'm not craving those compliments or those affirmations from people because the Holy Spirit is already giving those to me and the gospel tells me that I'm valuable. See, I don't, I don't need to uh, have people tell me that I'm really good at my job because you see, uh, the, 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 the Bible says that I do my work now unto the Lord and he's the one that sees it and my reward is in heaven for anything that I do. And so I'm not looking, I'm not looking for any of this because I'm getting filled up by the gospel. I'm getting filled up by the gospel. What do you need from this world that you really don't need from this world? That you actually need from Jesus. Last one. Last one. Dear Jesus, help me notice and care more about the soul than the smell. We were, uh, I, I was with the, the interns probably about a, a month and a half ago. And uh, we were doing this, this time, about two hours worth called practical ministry time. And we went to grocery outlet and we bought a bunch of stuff that we truly felt that, that were gonna benefit uh, people that were homeless. And uh, we bought these big Ziploc bags and we started putting these packages together of um, just different things that would help and uh, different snacks that would really um, be good for them and, and satisfy the hunger and we put water in there and all of this kind of stuff. And we got into the parking lot, we got into the car and this is the prayer that we prayed. We said, Lord, don't just take us to homeless people, take us to the right people. Take us to the people that were praying earlier for you to send somebody. Take us to the people that, that, that really, really need this God, that are really open to you right now. Take us to the most effective place. And we started driving down the road, and I kid you not, there's this, there's this eye contact that takes place with me and this, this other guy, and he's kitty corner uh, from us in, in this um, intersection. So we pull off, and we park, and, and uh, Eli's in the front seat, and Maggie and Katie are in the back, and um, Eli and I jump out, and... I'm gonna confess something, it had been a while. It had been a while since I had strictly approached somebody about the gospel. And I walk up to him, before I can say anything, he goes, oh, by the way, he started walking towards us. My God, help us out. 
<laughs> God's like, here you go. Um, he, he comes over. He says this before I can say anything. He says, I'm supposed to talk to you guys. And I don't know what to say, so I like hold up the bag. He starts weeping. He goes, I had just asked that guy that walked past me for a sandwich or something. I'm so hungry. He goes, I'm walking right now to the detox center. I'm on heroin right now. I'm so frustrated. I just want to kick it. But I don't know if I'm going to walk in. I said, bro, God, God wanted this to take place. So Eli and I, we put our hands on his shoulders and we started praying for him just that God would give him courage, that God would just meet him right where he was. And he said, you know what, I, I, got, uh, I got kicked out of this program that I was a part of at the altar because I relapsed and, I, and I, I know that I'm welcome back there, but I just, I, 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 I don't know. I'm so frustrated because I've tried so many times. I've tried so many times. I said, bro, we're going to drive you to the detox center. We're going to drive you there. And he goes, no, 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 that's okay. I said, well, what's the issue? He goes, I know that I smell. Bro, we don't care. We don't care. Jump in our car. Come on, let's go. We got to watch that guy walk through the front doors of the detox center and admit himself to get clean off of heroin. It's a good story, but the story continues. A couple weeks later, we get a call from the altar. It says, hey, there's a guy that just admitted himself back into our program that knows you. <laughs> Said that you met him on the street and you wouldn't have been able to get there if it wasn't for you and your friends. Do we care more about the soul than the smell? Do we care more? What do we have to give? Because there's somebody out there that's praying for someone like you to show up. And I'm tired of my hands being clean. 